Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this workshop is hosted by OFMA. We're the Oregon Farmers Markets Association. We offer workshops, training, and peer meetups every month to help support the people who run farmers markets in making their, making their markets better. Um, we have a few things like ways that we usually run our workshops. These are our participation hopes. Um, we love it when cameras are on. We love to see you. If you've ever had to be a presenter over Zoom, you may know that being able to see other people's faces um, does help you see better how information is landing um, and helps you stay connected with the presentation you're making. So we, we do love to see people's faces. We also understand um, when it's more supportive to have the camera off for wherever you're in. So um, either way is good, but just wanna welcome seeing people. Um, there'll be discussion and Q&A at the end of the time, but feel free to ask clarifying questions along the way, either out loud or in the chat. You can add longer discussion in the chat for others to see as we go along. And always just be aware of the room, lead with kindness and respect and check out how much time and space you're drawing to yourself. If you tend to speak a lot, please move up into a role of listening more or using the chat to post your thoughts. And if you rarely speak, we'd really love to hear from you. Um, we'd love to hear new things. So please experiment with sharing more than usual. Uh, when you're talking, it's great if you can share your name when starting to speak, which makes me realize I didn't share my name. Hi, I'm Amanda Cross. I'm the programs manager at OFMA. Um, I help run the programs here, um, all of our workshops and um, help for farmers markets. Madeline Tucker is also here. She's our communications manager. Madeline, if you wanna wave hello. Um, anyway, feel free to eat, drink, stretch, move around. Um, kid and animal cameos are always welcome. Be comfortable here. I'm now gonna uh, pass this on to Megan Bullock. She's the creative director from Mesh Studio, who's, been, who's our guest expert for today. Uh, Mesh Studio has been a partner with OFMA for several years now. They're the ones that put together our beautiful package of, um, of logos and other graphics that we've been using for several years now, including this cool background that we have. Um, Megan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Amanda. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. I see some faces and, and waves. Um, I believe this is uh, 10 o'clock your time in Oregon, right? So, so good morning. Um, I hope you all have had your coffee or your morning rituals and um, you're ready to settle in and um, learn and discuss today. Um, we have two hours. Is that, that's right, Amanda? Yeah. We have two hours with you today, which is a lot of time. So we'll be taking breaks and um, we'll have a, a lot of time at the end for discussion and questions um, and learning. And yeah, I just, what Amanda said that um, I encourage everyone to, um, you know, welcome cameos of kids and animals. You may hear my uh, baby crying in the background at some point or another today. Um, and also welcome you to get up and stretch um, if you need to and, you know, stay hydrated and um, and be comfortable because it's a lot to look at a screen for two hours. So I love doing these in person, but this is where we are now. So um, I'm also happy to, to be able to reach so many different people in different places um, by doing this online. So like I said, my name is Megan, Megan Bullock. I'm the uh, creative director and founder at um, Studio Mesh. Um, I have been designing brands and, um, and books and printed materials and digital materials and websites and signage and exhibition graphics for clients all over the world for the past 15 years. Um, and I especially love working in um, food and food justice and food equity work. And I love working with farmers markets. Um, if any of you attended any of the uh, brand and marketing workshops that I taught last year, uh, you may have been familiar with my work, but I'm going to introduce it a little bit today so you know who you're talking to. Um, 
And I would encourage you, if you weren't able to attend the brand and marketing workshop last year, it's accessible on the Oregon Farmers Market Association website. Um, I think you can watch the video and then there's a bunch of great tools and resources. So this workshop today, we're gonna go over print marketing. So market signage, environmental graphics, giveaways and other goodies and, and merch um, and swag that you can give away at your market. This all builds on um, the branding work that I shared with you last year. So I would encourage um, each of your markets, if you haven't had a chance to do this, to just take a fresh look at your brand identity. Um, I'm getting kind of, I'm a brand designer, but I'm getting a little bit sick of the word branding. I'm hearing it everywhere. Um, but really the way that I think about it is building collective identities for markets. So um, building consistent visual look and feel. Um, logos are like your signatures. Um, and consistent messaging that really brings to life um, a market and, and market vendors. So um, that is the first step. That's the foundation to have some kind of consistent consensus um, around what your market is called, um, your market colors, your market, um, your market typography, your messaging. And then from there, then you can start to create materials in um, that you put out into the community. So with that, get started here. So I already introduced myself. Um, this is me, we're a communication design studio. We make lots of things. And are you all, can I get a thumbs up? Is everyone seeing my screen move around? Okay, great. Um, these are a lot of the different things that I've been making um, with my studio for a very long time. Um, please check out my website if you wanna see, um, my studio's website, if you wanna see some of our work. Um, we were really happy to work with Oregon Farmers Market Association. As Amanda mentioned, um, we've also worked with the West Virginia Farmers Market Association. We're currently working with a um, food and farm association in North Carolina right now, Farmer Food Share. We've done a lot of food equity work in um, Detroit, and also throughout New York City, like uh, we did a large um, healthy food campaign um, in collaboration with a lot of kids and young people in the Bronx a few years ago. That was really fun. So um, really comfortable thinking through how um, signage and identity design and, um, and printed materials can work for different audiences, both in rural spaces and urban spaces. And I know that in Oregon, you have both, um, you have urban and rural. So all the advice that I'm sharing with you today uh, applies, applies to both. Um, I guess I will also just add before I get into the nitty gritty that I'm originally from Appalachia. So right now I'm talking to you today from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm originally from a small town of 60 people in West Virginia. And so uh, rural and urban are very close to my heart. I actually travel back and forth and I work between West Virginia and New York now. So um, so that's a little about me. Um, so last year I talked about channels of communication. Um, so this is just something I wanted to revisit today and I just started to talk about. So once you have your identity and um, you know ag agreed upon direction for how you wanna talk about your market, um, then you wanna figure out how you reach all of your, your audiences. Your audiences are your customers, your current customers that you have, um, and also potential new customers that could come to your market. And then there's all of these different channels, these different ways that we can communicate with people, with, with our audiences, in-person interactions, product design, um, website, uh, and other digital channels, social media channels, print work, and signage. So today we're going to be really focused on these two. Um, we're also going to talk about how to empower your audiences to um, to be amplifiers for you. So we think of like a sticker or a story card as almost a megaphone that you are giving your audiences, like your dedicated customers, um, to go out into your communities, into your neighborhoods, into your towns and cities uh, to talk about your market and to reach all of these other people out here, all of these other shapes and colors of people. 
Okay, so how do you put your best foot forward with signage and printed giveaways? So this is a bit of an overview of what we're gonna go over um, today. So first we're gonna do a section on, uh, we're gonna do some, some talking around signage. I'm gonna just go over a little bit about what that is. I think probably everyone knows. We're gonna talk about permanent signage versus temporary signage. Market signage messaging, uh, what do signs say? So hierarchy of information, signage as art, best practices for vendor booth signage, uh, and a little bit on how to choose materials and vendors and, and working with printers. And then we're gonna go into print promotions, um, the power of a sticker and a story card. So if you uh, need to do some marketing on a budget, sticker and a story card are wonderful. I'm gonna talk about those a little bit more. Um, tote bags and other merch empower brand ambassadors. So brand ambassadors are power customer. They're, they're customers that come to your market every week that, um, that, are, that love shopping at your market and really support you and wanna help, like I said, um, spread spread the word about your market and your community and your neighborhood. So we're going to talk about how to empower folks to do that uh, with print materials and um, and then how to choose materials and vendors for print work. So I have some recommendations on that. So before we get into it, I'm just going to pause. Does anyone have any questions, um, concerns? If you want to turn your mic on, you're welcome to do that. If you want to put anything in the chat. Yeah, I saw Cave Junction Farmers Market put one of their signs in the chat. If other people want to feel free to share any pictures too in the chat that you have. We'd love to see what's going on at your market. Great. Okay, so I'm going to get into this. So signage. So I think we all probably, we all know what signage is. Signage is anything that, um, that is hung up in some type of um, publicly accessible space that uh, communicates something to the people that walk by, right? So it's not it's not digital. It can be photographed and it can go live in the digital world. It can be shared on social media, but it's in a physical space. Um, for farmers market signage, um, signage is it can be big or small, permanent or temporary. Um, and it can be made of a lot of different materials. Um, it can be a permanent mural. It can be a hand-painted sign. Um, it can be hand-painted sign or mural on wood that's moved around or that's installed onto a permanent structure. Um, it can be uh, printed on vinyl or, um, or paper or lots of different types of materials that you can print on. And it can also be hand drawn on a chalkboard or a whiteboard um, for more ephemeral temporary signage. So lots of different options for um, what you can do for signage for your market. Um, here's just some, some options here. Here's a, a beautiful permanent mural. Um, and just wanted to share today as we're talking about signage, um, Sisters Farmers Market, and one, this is one of your markets here, in Oregon, and they do a really wonderful job um, with signage. They have taken a very simple approach where they are just reinforcing their name on lots of different materials. So this is one way to do signage. Um, it looks like they have this, this pop-up um, sandwich board here with the arrow uh, directing people to where to go. They have their um, tabletop signage. So this is where you print um, signage or a logo directly onto a tablecloth rather than wrapping it around. Um, and so that's really easy to move in and out of a market. Um, and it's big and clear and you can, you read it really easily. Um, and then we have uh, vinyl, this looks like a vinyl sign here. And also um, then, you know, thinking through how signage can be on merch. So how you can, this is like what we would call a brand ambassador. This person is um, representing the Sisters Farmers Market. So lots of different ways to do signage um, and lots of things to communicate on signage. I think people try and communicate a lot on signage and I just really love how Sisters kept it really simple here. They do have a tagline right here by Seed the Table. So that's what we would call like a value add messaging. But um, 
but they've kept everything else really simple. I uh, also talked a little bit about temporary signage. So chalkboards are a really great low cost way to, um, to build beautiful signage. Um, they're used for farmers markets all over the place, all over the world. Um, and they're really wonderful because they're easy to update. So you could hire an artist or maybe one of, maybe someone at your market or a volunteer or you um, loves to draw and do hand leathering. So you could do something like this at the Livingston Farmer's Market. Um, this looks like this, these little icons are hand-drawn as well. Um, or you can keep it more um, straightforward. Maybe you have a lot of information to update. So this would be great for vendor signage, but um, you can also do hand-drawn, handwritten signage. And then this looks like this is printed on a chalkboard. So that's another option that you can print on a chalkboard. And then you could add... You know, maybe your hours are changing seasonally, so you could add hand-drawn writing. So you could print the permanent information on the chalkboard and then add the hand-drawn writing. So lots of ideas there. Okay, so permanent versus temporary signage. So it seems to me, just at a quick glance at the chat, that a lot of folks here have temporary signage um, because you have to be mobile, right? The, your markets pop up and then... Um, and then that, that space is a transient space probably that your market is in. And so throughout the week, maybe it has lots of different functions. Maybe cars are parked there. Maybe it's a parking lot. Maybe it's a field. Um, so that's the beauty of farmer's markets is that they can pop up for small amounts of time, but it does present challenges with, um, you have to move everything in and everything out. That must be so much work. I can't, I can't imagine. My job, I have a computer and it's a lot to carry around. I can't imagine popping up tents and signage every week. So um, so Amanda actually asked me to talk with you all today about ways to keep things movable um, and mobile. And I'll just share that I don't have that much experience with that. So we'll talk about that. But um, if anyone else has suggestions, um, please add those to the chat today about, you know, how you might have a solution you might have found to move signage in your space. So um, I will talk about permanent versus temporary signage, though. Um, so um, if you have the opportunity to have permanent signage, um, it's really wonderful to just highlight and feature your name first and foremost. Um, and, and then maybe some type of illustration or imagery or value, uh, value add messaging. Value add messaging would be anything that um, communicates the values of your market. Um, shop local, eat fresh are uh, uh, common used farmer's market messaging, right? But there's lots of other things that we'll talk about today. Um, so really love this Lane County Farmer's Market um, signage here. So this looks to be hand painted. And at first I actually thought this was on a wall and I was like, that's wonderful. It's a, they're using, they've created a mural and they um, have also created a sign for themselves for their market. And then I realized that this is on a truck. So this is a really creative way to have some kind of I guess, to blur the line between permanent and temporary signage. I mean, this is a permanent sign, but it's mobile, right? So maybe it comes to the market. Uh, I don't know what Lane County Farmers Market is doing. If Lane hey, County Megan, or, Me Megan, <laughs> Megan from Lane County is actually here. Would you want her to say? say, say yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi, yes. Um, so this is our old market van that we would load up all you know our info booth equipment and tokens and everything we needed for the day into this drive to our market site and um at our old site we were able to park the van um in a pretty prominent location um and it was really great because people loved the yeah just the the picture and would come and take pictures in front of it um and so it was kind of nice marketing for the market in that way Unfortunately, this van no longer runs. <laughs> it's um, it's from the 70s, I think. And we we do actually still have it, but we're not using it anymore. Well, um, thank you for sharing. I loved this. I saw that little wheel and then I went deeper on the internet. Um, so I guess you're bringing up a good point to share that if you did do signage on a truck or a van, there is still a lifespan to that. 
Um, but I think every permanent sign, anything that you would invest in, even a mural on the side of a building, um, would have to be maintained through time. So there is a little bit of maintenance, no matter what permanent sign um, you create. But Megan, thanks for sharing. I love, I love this option, uh, the, this direction of a uh, van. We've done a lot of food trucks over the years. Um, and so those are permanent signs that just drive around town just like this. And um, and it's really wonderful because you can put the name of the business or the or the market on one side, and then you can have some type of messaging on the other. Like we worked for a vegan food truck and it just said vegan forever on the whole side of the truck on one side. And then it had the name of the business on the other. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about murals and, and ways to do more permanent signage a little bit later, but um, that's just something to consider. Temporary signage, um, it sounds like is what a lot of you all are doing. Um, in, in this image here, I really love how uh, the value add messaging is actually on this whiteboard. So this is something to consider that you don't have to have all of your messaging on one sign. You can layer them like this. So you can have some kind of larger sign that maybe is a bigger investment, whether it's a mural or a large printed pop-up banner or um or something that may be more expensive, you you ideally would just want to have your name and some simple evergreen messaging. And then you can layer with a whiteboard or a chalkboard or smaller printed posters with um, more temporary or ephemeral messaging. Um, something like this, like the I Love Farmers Market campaign, it sounds like they that they did, or maybe there's seasonal hours, or maybe there's a call to action that you want to share with folks that can be, work really well on temporary signage. So we talked about chalkboards earlier. Here are um, here are two different chalkboard pop up signs, the sandwich boards. Um, this one on the left makes it very clear that you're coming to a farmer's market. That's the first thing that you read here. And then they have their hours. So that's what they chose as their most important information. And then on the right here, um, I, I think that if the, if I were going to, I love that this sign says um, produce at the grocery traveled um, 1,500 miles. I love that they have this information. This is... Um, you know, really great value add messaging that's sharing information about why why someone should shop at the farmer's market. I would love if Hood River Farmer's Market was a lot bigger. So I'm I'm wishing and, and thinking maybe Hood River Farmer's Market's here today that on the other side, it says Hood River's Farmer's Market really, really big. So that's just something to think about that you don't always have to have all your messaging on one sign. You can have multiple layers. Okay. So market signage messaging. So we've talked about permanent versus temporary materials and signage, but I'm, I'm discussing with you all what type of messaging should be communicated on more permanent signage versus temporary. So here's something, here's, here's a different way to think about it, is a hierarchy of information in your signage. So what, what you want to do is really think back to your target audiences, the people you're trying to connect with, and think about um, what kind of questions they may ask and how you can answer those questions. So the number one thing to communicate is your market name. Um, who are you? Especially on permanent signage. That's really the main thing that should go on permanent signage. Um, and then these, I have these in order here. I like to see value at value driven messaging or inspirational messaging. Um, what's important to your market? So that's like eating fresh and local. The um, sharing how far your food's traveling. Um, it can be inspirational quotes. Um, this is ultimately optional, but it really helps people understand why it's important to shop at your market. Um, and then you want to answer, how do we find out more? So it's always good to have a website, a social media handle, um, QR codes are becoming popular because of the pandemic and how they were used on menus. So a lot of people are starting to use QR codes again. There's free generators online. You can just go to just Google QR code generator if you want to use the QR code. Um, I would recommend not putting a QR code on permanent signage because they're this weird thing that keeps going in and out of style. So sometimes like 
seven years ago, it looked really dated to have a QR code on your work. But I think 10 years ago, they were cool and they were this moderate, they were this new thing. So they're this thing that keeps going in and out of fashion. Right now, they're a way that, that people are used to putting their phone up and scanning the QR code because of um, the pandemic and the way that menus started to be done at restaurants. So that's just something to think about with temporary signage. But ultimately, you want to make sure you're answering how do we answering the question, how do folks find out more? You don't have to have all the information on your signage. You just need to point them into in the direction to find it. And lots of people are comfortable using their phone and um, accessing inf more information digitally. And then when can we come by? So hours of operation. So this is definitely something that should be on temporary signage because um, you, you want to you want to be able to change that seasonally, and um, you want to be able to adapt with whatever needs of your market. So this is a great hierarchy of information uh, exercise for you to go through to ask these questions for yourself when you're thinking about signage. I think Crossroads Farmers Market sign does that really well here. That's just an example. So they have their name first. They have um, some beautiful value add messaging, a vital food resource for the community since 2007. And then they have uh, a way that you can find out more information. So this is, I haven't seen this that often. This is a little unconventional, the sign up for text updates. I have never seen a farmer's market do uh, text updates before. So if this is something you want to explore, you could check this out. But this could also just be to find out more information or to get updates. Um, follow us on Instagram, Instagram handle. Check out our website, website URL. So whatever your call to action is, um, that call to action should be for folks to go to a place to find out more information about the market and to get more up-to-date information about, you know, maybe it's the last um, pop-up of the season. Maybe there's some, some change because of the weather. So some place that they can go that you don't have to share that information in a million different places. You're just always pushing folks to that one place and they know that that's where that they can get the, um, they can check that Saturday morning and they can find out if the market's open that day. Um, let's see, just another example, hierarchy of information, um, and then just want to share value add messaging. So this is a type and solution that we did. You don't always have to have things branded. Um, so if you did a mural or if you, um, if you have, you know, if you pass maybe your favorite coffee shop and you see a little chalkboard sign and maybe they already have their logo and their name on their storefront the way that you might have a big banner in your space. So you could use a chalkboard um, with just some kind of simple statement or words or some beautiful poetry from a poet in your community. Um, or, you know, you could share on a chalkboard like one vendor's favorite thing about being part of the farmer's market each week or something like that. So something that inspires people. Um, this is a a uh, coffee shop that we work with in West Virginia. And um, so every time folks enter the space, uh, they read this message, you belong here. Okay, so gonna move on to signage as art. So um, I've done a lot of public art over the years. That's so one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I know that, uh, there's a lot of barriers to creating murals and public art in spaces, but this is a really cool thing to think about and consider. Um, it's a way to build relationships with volunteers and people in your community. It's a way to build relationships between your market and other business owners, um, other businesses between your market and your vendors. Um, it's really a way to bring people together. And um, so you can have, if you have access to some type of wall, or if there is some type of wall, possibly you could gain access, you could talk to a building owner um, and get permission to use a wall. You could do a mural um, that communicated something about your market. So this is a market in San Francisco. I, I think it would, if you're going to invest in something like this, it should probably say farmer's market. So this example doesn't. 
um, but most of these in here do. So here's the Uptown Farmers Market. Um, and they actually have every Saturday, April to December. So that's painted on there. I think that's a little risky, but um, like I would have that in the bottom corner here and have it in a space that could be updated, but they went for it. Um, and this, and they have this beautiful mural. So this is the side of a whole building and it looks like it's at a, in a parking lot. So they probably got permission from this building owner to do this mural here. Um, here's one in Dallas. And you can see like the styles are very different. Like the, the style that if you wanted to do something like this, the style um, could be true to your, your identity of your market um, and to the spirit of your market. Here's one in Sonora. So again, very different style, very traditional. Springfield, Illinois, again, in the parking lot. So there's also, you see like these first two murals, Uptown Farmer's Market and Dallas took the whole side of the building. Um, so that's a lot of painting. That's a lot of work. It's really beautiful. Um, this one in Sonora has more of a shape and it's just like, it's almost like a large sticker on the side of a building, this one as well. So this would be a little bit less time and, and maybe less like a, you wouldn't have to spend as much because you're not covering the whole building. You're not, you're not buying paint to cover the whole building here. Um, I'm not sure where this one is, but I just, I loved this, um, this style. It feels really modern and just a departure from a lot of the farmer's market styles. So just wanted to share this here that it doesn't have to be, if you were going to do some type of public art mural, um, doesn't have to be a traditional farmer's market style. Um, it could be a pattern like this. This is something that we designed for OFMA. Um, I don't think that this has been brought into reality, but I would love, love, love to paint this somewhere one day. Um, so it can be a big pattern like this and the sign can be smaller. And then you can also do hand paint and sign work inside spaces. So let me talk about, I wanna talk about how to, some different ways that you could do murals. Um, okay, so so things to consider when you, if, if you might want to do something like this. First is, do you want to do something permanent on the building? Or I'm showing you a lot of permanent options here. I couldn't find an example of this, but you can also paint on, a piece of wood, like a like a large piece of um, plywood or um, something that is mobile and not permanent. If your building owner maybe would let you fasten something to the building that you're nearby, or um, I'm assuming that most of your markets are near a building, so they might not be. It could also be like a billboard style sign. So you could actually have something painted or made Onto, onto a piece of material that would be applied to a building and then could be removed in the future. Um, so those are two different ways that you could do some type of permanent signage like this. Um, you could hire, you could put together a committee would probably be the first thing to do and to get permission from a building owner or the land owner um, and to discuss and negotiate how you might uh, be able, what they would be open to for you to use the space. Um, you would want to gather funds for the project. So um, there's lots of public art um, funds and art councils all over. Uh, a lot of them actually have um, tips and tools for how to, if, if your community wants to do some type of public art mural, how to do that. I wasn't able to find anything in Oregon, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, so that's something that you could pursue if you were interested in doing this. Um, and so permission, uh, building a budget, you could do a fundraiser in your community or you could apply for grant funding. Um, and then you wanna think about who's going to make this. So you could hire an artist to do this. You could hire a sign painter to do this, or you could um, work with community members and you could do a community mural. Whenever I've worked on community murals before, I've still had an artist um, or some type of creative person that's organizing and kind of directing, the, excuse me, and directing and empowering the community to, um, to paint so that it, there's not complete chaos. There's some sort of plan and method. Um, although sometimes complete chaos is wonderful, but um, if you were going to just say you, you decided that you didn't want to hire an artist to do this and you wanted the community to paint something, you might want to pick 
some type of organizing principle. Like, okay, we're going to use these five colors and we're going to invite everyone in the community to come and paint their favorite local um, produce and farmer's market products. So there should be some type of brief so that there's some organizing principle around the mural. Um, yeah, so I think that those are, and, and then as we saw today, this can also be done on a truck or some type of mobile um, object as well. So, and what's, and if, if this was to be done, yeah, as we talked about, we just recommend really having your name um, and then having all of your other information accessible on, um, on smaller signage. Okay, and I'm, I'm remembering one last thing. So Megan actually said this earlier um, when she was talking about the Lane County Farmer's Market, but murals are a really wonderful marketing tool that can just pay dividends over time. So they serve as signage, but they also serve as beautiful backdrops for photography. So um, they can become really like icons in your community and they can represent the farmer's market, but if you have a beautiful mural that um, people can stand behind, then they can get the, take their picture with, um, with the mural and they can post on social media. You can do a hashtag campaign um, where you use a hashtag. Uh, you ask folks to, you, may, you can even put the hashtag in the corner of the mural. And anytime someone... Um, post a photo of themselves, a selfie or a group photo with the mural on any social media platform, they can tag your market and they can use the hashtag. And then if you go to the hashtag, you can see the collection of all the different people that have come through your market and taken pictures with or of your mural. Um, we have a mural in Charleston, West Virginia from a local folk artist um, that has now appeared all in, all over the world in different people come and travel to take their picture with different parts of the mural. Um, there's a hashtag campaign online and the, the artist actually has since passed away. And so it's become even more iconic and just this important destination in my hometown and the community that I'm from. So they can really become powerful tools um, for building community and inviting people in. Okay, I think this is the the last thing I wanted to. Oh, I have two more two more sections to talk about with signage. Okay, so um, best practices for vendor and booth signage. Okay, so a lot of vendor and booth signage to look at here. So, um. Vendor and booth signage is different. Vendor booth signage is, is a little bit different than market signage. So market signage, you want to be big and bold and you're inviting people into the market. Um, you can give vendors all, if you wanted to, you can give them limitations on their signage or you could give them branded signage from your market that um, so that all the signage looks consistent throughout your market. Uh, I've worked with a few markets over the years that have done that. But most of the time you see that each vendor is responsible for bringing their own signage. Um, often we're seeing, we see vinyl signs like this. Um, sometimes you'll see where the pop-up, the actual tent and the um, tablecloth are branded and are serving as signage. This is really wonderful because it makes it easy to pop up, easier to pop up. You're not having to like, hang a vinyl sign like this every week. Um, you're actually having your tent printed on um, and you're having your table taught your, um, what is this called? Tablecloth printed on. Um, sorry, I lost that word. Um, and then I think that this is still hung here, but it looks like it's built into the pop-up. So there's lots of companies online that will um, will print situations like this. It's not cheap but it's it's it saves on time for the actual setup so this might be something that you recommend to vendors and then they have it looks like just one product sign and smaller information on signage here but just with these three pieces um their tent their tablecloth and then this back panel here they have a really beautiful signage setup um 
for chow mushrooms in Oregon. So this is really simple, but uh, beautifully designed and hung, hung really nicely. And um, they again have the layered signage where they their messaging is working really well here. They have very clear um, Bridgetown mushrooms. You know who they are and, and what they're what, what's available there. They have value add messaging, fresh, local, and organic. It's for them, it was important to tell to say where they're from. So place-based messaging. Um, and then they have their signage for their products here. And this is just hand-drawn temporary signage. So perfect example of a more permanent sign and then temporary signage. So that changes a little bit from the per idea of permanent and temporary from the market that we were just talking about as a whole to vendor signage. And here's another nice example. Um, Tatulia, I'm not sure how to say this. Um, Tatulia True Fish LLC, uh, just very clear sign, clear call to action. It would be great to have their handle on here as well. Um, people didn't used to share handles, but now it's becoming more normal. By your handle, I just mean like your at sign, so at mesh design. Um, because there's so many accounts on social media now, more every day, and you could look up this name and maybe there's three businesses with that name. So then you might have to look at the accounts and try and figure out which one is a fish company, um, but if they just put their handle there or if there's a QR code that they can scan to access their account on Instagram, like a QR code would be great as just like a little tabletop pop up here, um, then folks could find them. So, yeah, and then Woodlawn Neighbors, Woodlawn Neighborhood Farmers Market. Um, so here is an example of where they have a vinyl banner over top of their tent. So it would be really wonderful if they were, it would be easier for them um, to pop up if they were able to print their name directly on the tent, like we saw earlier. So that's just an idea to make the pop-up easier. Um, obviously that's not always possible, but um, yeah. And then they have some signage back here, but I actually can't read what this is. So that that's also just something to think about is, um, when you're designing, when you're rec uh, making recommendations and giving advice to your vendors, um, make sure that their signage is um, accessible and legible. So I don't have this in this presentation here, but if you go, I'm, I'm going to share with you um, the new uh, chapter that we just launched this morning on signage um, on the Oregon Farmers Market Association website. And um, you will be able to see some written out best practices for booth signage vendors. So those best practices are for you to be able to um, feel confident reading and then giving advice to your uh, vendors at your market on things that they could do to improve their signage. So I'm just gonna share some with you right now. Well, yeah, I'm going to share some with you right now. Um, some key things to consider to share with vendors are a big sign is best. Um, so if they if they want to share their name, having a larger sign as opposed to just like a tabletop sign um, is better. A tablecloth sign is also great if they have their name printed on the front of the tablecloth. Um, make sure that your sign is readable and stable. Um, if they're, if your vendor might be working under budget constraints, one big sign with the vendor name and logo is, is great. We just saw that here. We saw that above, um, with Tatula True Fish, just one sign, but, um, it's clear. It's really easy to read and Bridgetown mushrooms, um, List of what makes a good sign for vendors. So stability. So make sure this is this is advice you can provide to your vendors. Make sure your sign is sturdy and stable and not blowing in the wind. If it's blowing in the wind, it's not going to be legible. So make sure your sign is legible. Readability is important. Um, you want you want the sign to be accessible. Um, you want folks to be able to read the name and you want to consider accessibility. So high contrast, big and bold signs are great. Portability, we've been talking about that a lot. Um, so make it's best if the sign is easy to open and close and to carry. Um, 
like thinking about if you need a push cart so it's easy for your volunteers to install your signs um, as you move in and out. If anyone else has any suggestions on the portability of signage today, I'd love if you wanted to share those in the chat. Um, clean, so gently and kindly and confidently uh, recommend to your vendors that they should have clean signs. If you see a vendor that has a dirty sign, um, you know, they're, they're gonna have trouble that's not going to do them any favors uh, as they are uh, trying to sell whatever product that they work so hard to, to grow and to make, right? So if your sign is dirty, then you're kind of doing yourself a disservice and um, you might be communicating that your booth is dirty if you didn't take the time to clean your sign, when in reality, I'm sure everyone's market products are beautiful and delicious and clean. So little the little things about vendor signage communicate um, what folks are going to experience with their products. So that's just something that you can confidently share with your vendors. Um, and like we talked about, simple, clear messaging. So I haven't shared any um, what I call wild signs today, but there I've definitely seen many a wild sign in my day where everything that you might have on a website is trying to be squeezed into a sign. <laughs> So that's why I shared that information hierarchy earlier. Um, those four things that we went over, your name, um, some value add messaging, a way, a call to action, way to get in touch with you to find out more, and um, your hours of operation. Those are really the four main things that need to be communicated. And hours of operation don't need to be communicated with vendors. So there's really just three things for vendors. Um, that's all you need on signage and then have all your inform other information somewhere else. If you try and cram everything, every thought and idea, everything you want folks to know in a sign, um, they're not going to read the sign. So we live in the age of the internet. People like to scan information quickly. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is how to choose signage vendors. So um, so there is a section on this, on, uh, the new chapter on the website as well. So the first thing I would recommend is check out your local options. So in this same, I, I'm assuming that you all, all want folks to shop local. That's an assumption I'm making, but, um, as farmers markets, um, that seems like a key, a, a core principle, a core value. And so if you want other folks to do that, then I recommend that you all consider that as well and try and live that value. So if you have a local business that does printing in your town and they do a good job with it, I'd recommend working with them. Um, and I will go to them and I would tell them what you're looking for and um, maybe they, some sign companies do design work. Maybe you've done design work. Maybe you have... Um, an account on Canva that you've designed something that you can send them files. Uh, working with a local printer is best. So uh, in the towns that I work with, there's a family run business in Charleston, West Virginia, Charleston Blueprint. Um, and it's run by um, now actually a woman that I grew up with. Uh, she inherited it from her parents. And I love supporting that small family business. And so they do lots of my printing uh, for clients in that town. In New York City, I work with Long Island City Printing. So I always try and find a local printer. Okay. If you can't find a local printer or if the local printer is really pricing you out, that's um, something for you to decide. Um, but there are also um, other printers that you can work with. Um, Fast Signs is a national company, but they generally, I think they franchise and they generally have local ownership. So they're um, something to consider. There are definitely fast sign um, branches throughout Oregon. Let's see here. Um, so that, that's worth considering and maybe a bridge between a local and a national printer. Um, if none of those options work, then you can also check out online printers like Vistaprint. Vistaprint is a great option. There's a link to the Vistaprint website um, in the chapter on the Oregon Farmers Market Association website. And um, they do wonderful signs. They do big rollout vinyl signs. They do pop-up banner signs. Um, 
I think they also do the table tent signs that, that I was talking about earlier. So they're they're a great printer. They're worth checking out. Um, I shared another uh, signage option, a company called Pieces of Sign. They do really modern, simple signs, just worth checking out. Um, and then I also shared uh, some advice from Leathering Daily on um, how to learn to sign paint and how to work with a sign painter. So there is a resource online if you choose to go that route. I would definitely recommend trying to connect with your local um, public art department or arts council. Um, I'm sure that they would love to uh, advise on a project like that or just even the feasibility of a project like that. But you can also go to uh, this resource that I've shared. So I'm going to... I'm going to pull that up right now. Okay, so if you go to the Oregon Farmers Market Association website um, and you go to resources, brand and marketing toolkit at the bottom here, these are all the chapters. Um, so brand and marketing 101, if you haven't read it, recommend checking it out brand strategy and development, owned, earned, and paid media. Um, and then this chapter was just added today, print signage and environmental graphics and print printed giveaways and goodies, which we're gonna go over in a second. So if you go to the signage and environmental graphics section, a lot of the information I've gone over um, today is also accessible here and um, and a lot of it is written up for you, permanent signage versus temporary signage, um, market signage messaging. So here's that hierarchy of information we talked about. Um, there's a little bit more information on value-driven messaging and, and how to think about um, what might work for your market. Signage as art, we talked about that. Best practices for vendor booth signage. So this is information that you can refer back to when you are... Um, maybe second guessing yourself on how to talk with a vendor, you can refer back to this page and you have that advice there. Okay, and then here are some tools and resources. So here is a link to Vistaprint, pieces of sign and an article on working with sign painters. So uh, we're gonna take a break in just a second here, but um, just wanna share as well, there's an FAQs section. Uh, what are the audiences? These are just some questions that I've talked through with Amanda and Madeline. What audience is signage for? What needs uh, to go on signage? So we talked about that a little bit. How important is it for signage to change and be refreshed? Can we make something that we intend to use for several years? So we talked about permanent and temporary signage. Um, tips for working with a sign or banner printer. What types of files do they need? So. High resolution PDFs are usually best uh, for high quality, but I always recommend talking to the printer because printers have different processes. And um, even as a design company, we work with lots of different printers and we always talk to our printer before we um, prepare files. And then what are the what are cheapest, most effective ideas? So we've talked about that a little bit as well. Um, the last resource that is not shown here, I just want to share um, if ever, anyone is not familiar with Canva. Canva has some great templates for uh, large scale signage design. And I'm seeing Canva grow in its community every day. There are lots of new templates always being added. More and more of my clients are working on Canva. Um, so if you're not sure where to start with creating signage files, um, you might want to check out Canva. So with that, let's see here. Oh, some more signage. Oh yeah, craft paper rolls are really wonderful, but I think that's more for permanent spaces. Yep, and we're gonna take a quick break. So um, we're gonna take a five minute break now and then we're going to spend the next 20 to 30 minutes talking about um, printed giveaways and merch. Uh, I don't have as much information on that. It's not going to be as long going through that section. So we'll do that for about 30 minutes and then we'll have about 30 minutes left for discussion and QA. If you have questions about any of the signage, feel free to put those in the chat during this, this break right now. So I will talk to you all in five minutes.
Hey folks, I'm just um just giving you a one minute. Hello. And I'm back. All right, I hope everyone enjoyed their five minutes of rest and relaxation. <laughs> everyone ready to get started again? Okay. Yep, I think you can get started, Megan. Okay, great. So, all right. Um, during my five minutes, I was just reviewing the chat and I saw some questions about um, the canopy tents and banners. And so I just went a little bit deeper on Vistaprint right now. So I'm just going to share with you all. Um, share my full screen again here with you. So um, Vistaprint has it's just an industry standard, but there's so many other printers. I'm also just noticing Vistaprint's prices have gone up. So I think that they run a lot of sales. Um, so it's worth, if you if you wanted to print with them, um, to wait for a sale. But if you go to their signer, sign banners and posters section, you're going to see a ton of different signage options, some of which I showed you all today. Um, there are some things... So I, I would recommend, I know it's more expensive, but if it's possible within your budgets, if you're able, if you decide to do some type of like mass produced signage like this um, to consider um, selecting like a, rec a recycled material to print on, it always increases the budget a little bit, but then you can even, you can tell people that you can um, have that printed that this is post on, this is printed on, 100% uh, recycled material um, if you're going to go this route because we want to be, if sustainability is important to your market, um, which I hope that it is, then you want to be living those values. Um, I talked a lot about uh, chalkboards today. I just want to bring up that Vistaprint has a chalkboard that you can print on. So you will print your logo here and then you could write on the chalkboard. Um, also, they have the tablecloth I was talking about. Um, so this is on 100% post-consumer recycled material. You can do three-sided, four-sided. So this is $350, not cheap for a sign, but this could be your only sign for, as a vendor. Like this is, if you do this tablecloth well, this could be done, this, this could be all you need. It could be a big, beautiful logo, and then you could have some printed tabletop signage. Um, Canopy tents, someone asked in the chat about have they done canopy tents before? So here's Vistaprint's canopy tent and it's pretty expensive, it's a grand. And so I just did a really quick search and there's lots of canopy tent printers online if you wanted to do this. Um, again, I would recommend um, checking with local printers first, um, but I just found this one for, uh, yeah, it's on sale for $200 and it has the printing on the front and the back. So it's probably, not as customizable as Vista Print, but it could get the job done. Um, and then I just wanted to share one other um, thought. Where did it go? Um, pole banner signage. If your town already has pole banner signage, this is something that you could consider to go to your city and ask if the farmer's market could promote um, their market on the city's pole banner signage. If they, if your town doesn't have this, it's a lot to get this, um, hardware installed. So for probably that's not a battle that you want to, um, get into with all the other things that you're doing running a market. But if you do have it, this is also, um, a really great option. Okay. So it's just a little follow-up to some of the questions I saw in the chat. Um, so and with our the rest of our time today, we are going to get into printed giveaways and goodies. So because I'm already sharing my screen with you, I'm just going to show you that um, this new chapter, just excuse me, this new chapter, um, printed giveaways and goodies, was uh, published this morning on the Oregon Farmers Market website. So this covers a lot of the information that I'm going to go over today, and um, is a great resource 
for for you all to reflect back on in addition to uh, the recording of this workshop. So, okay. Um, so print promotions. We didn't ask about this, but I assume that probably a lot of people here have done a flyer, some kind of flyer and maybe a poster before. Flyers tend to be the go-to for print promotions if you do one thing. Um, is that true? Do you, do you all, does anyone could maybe as I'm going through this today, you could share in the chat. Uh, some of the different printed promotions that you, uh, your market has done in the past. Okay. So the way that we think of printed promotional work is that this is a great investment after you have invested in a strong brand and logo and um, and you have your signage, then this is another channel for you to reach audiences and for you to start to empower your audiences, your customers to help you reach other people. So um, lots of fun examples today I'm gonna to share with um, different farmers market design work. Um, when you're doing print work, you can you always want to think about how the graphics that you've created and the messaging can be recyclable on your different channels. So if you do a printed poster um, or some kind of flyer or postcard, then um, have that graphic saved out to be shareable on social media and on your website as well. So it's really easy to save these to sa save design work in different formats. Um, so that way you're consistent across your, your channels of communication. And that's a great way to get the most bang for your buck if you're working with a designer or um, even if you're designing something for, for yourself, if you're making something on Canva, you spend a lot of time making that thing. So spend the extra 10 to 15 minutes just resizing it to be shared on different platforms. Um, okay, so I have a lot of examples in here, but I'm just gonna... Um, give you an overview when you're investing in print work you don't have to um same thing that we talked about with your signage your print work doesn't have to do everything for you it just needs to do a few things effectively and so you want to think about what messaging what, what's most important to have on that print work and and share that so just some examples here um here's this is uh for western Virginia's Far western Virginia farmers market association some materials we've done over the years um We've done tabletop uh, printouts for them, as we've talked about. We've created stamps for them. Stamps are a really great way to um, to brand a lot of different printed materials. Um, water bottles, we have hang tags, and tote bags, and these are just some other ideas, kitchen towels, aprons. So when you're thinking about what you want to um, what you want to what what printed promotional materials that you want to create you want to think about um, what is going to reinforce my brand values and help me connect with my audiences so if you if it's important to you to um, be a sustainable market that's supporting local business then think about working with local vendors like we talked about and think about creating items that have second lives to them okay so a water bottle if if you don't want people to use a bunch of plastics and maybe you have a lot of vendors that have drinks at your uh, market then you could uh, have a sticker printed and you could brand water bottles you could um, give give these away or sell them i'm going to talk about that in a second um and um, and then encourage people to bring their water bottle to the market and maybe they get, maybe there's some kind of incentive or perk if they bring their market water bottle to the market to get their weekly lemonade from their favorite lemonade vendor. Um, or the same thing with a thermos, with a reusable coffee cup, you could put a branded sticker on um, a reusable coffee cup and you could sell those as a uh, fundraiser for the market or a merch piece for the market. And then if folks bring their reusable market coffee cup um, to the market each week, then they get a discount on coffee from your coffee vendor or something like that. Um, 
So that helps reinforce your brand values. That, that's a great way for you to think about what to print on. If you want to print um, a bunch of, um, I'm trying to think of an unsustainable thing. A lot of anything that you think you're going to see in a trash can or a landfill, just go ahead and scratch that out. Don't, don't even think about printing on that. Instead, think about things that have second lives. Tote bags are also wonderful ways to reinforce um, shopping local and um, sustainable, responsible consumerism, right? So um, bring your tote bag instead of plastic to our market. These things also then become tools for you. Um, they work for your market when you're not working. So if I have a branded farmer's market coffee cup and I am at a meeting at my local office and then I'm at the um, my community, my monthly community board meeting, and then I'm going through my grocery store and I'm carrying my farmer's market mug, then anyone that sees my, my mug is being reminded of the farmer's market. So that's working for you when you, um, when you, when you're not even open without you having to do anything. It's also, um, it's also building representatives or like I call them brand ambassadors for you. So if I'm wearing my farmer's market t-shirt or carrying my toe or I have my coffee mug, um, I'm representing the market and I'm, you can have your logo. You can also have some fun, playful messaging, something that someone might come up to me and say, huh, what is that? And then I could have the opportunity to talk about your market and be a representative for you. So that's called building brand ambassadors. And that's how you want to think about those. Those are two things to think about when you're deciding what you want to invest in for printed materials. So does this reinforce my values as a market? And is this going to help me build brand ambassadors, help me empower other people to, um, to share the share the information that I want them to about the market. Okay, so here's just some other printed materials. Um, here's some things that we've done for Afma. I'm gonna talk about these more. Scarves are really fun. Um, you can work with a local artist to screen print scarves or apparel um, that reinforces the brand values. It gives you an opportunity to talk about local partnerships. Um, I'm gonna get into stickers in a second, but stickers are really wonderful, cost-effective ways to, to get the word out there for a lot of things. So stickers can become packaging options like this. I don't know if any of you do any kind of shipping. They're great for shipping. Um, they're great for a lot of other things I'm gonna talk about in here just in a second. So the power of a sticker and a story card. If you're gonna invest in anything, I just recommend after you have your signage and your branding, scrap flyers, scrap, I don't know, maybe you all, if someone wants to bring something up today that you think is the most important thing, I'd love to talk about it. But I would recommend that every farmer's market have a sticker and a story card. Okay, so a sticker can be placed on anything to brand so many different materials. People, if you, you give away a sticker, people can put it on their laptop and then all of a sudden you have advertising in your local coffee shop when that person is working in their coffee shop all week. Um, water bottles, you know, when they when folks are going to the gym, when folks are going to um, their 5K race over the weekend, your farmer's market is there and it has advertising. Um, you can give your stickers away at your market. You can also give your stickers to uh, partner businesses in your community and ask them to give them away with every purchase in their store or maybe they have a service that they provide. So if one of their clients comes in, they can have a farmer's market sticker if they want to. When you give those stickers to partner businesses um, or anyone else, give them one to two sentences, honestly, write them down for them um, so that their person that's at the front of the shop can say, oh, here, would you like a farmer's market sticker with your purchase? This is the XYZ farmer's market. They're open um, every Saturday from April to August. And um, they're, they're a real community hub. You, you can meet everyone there on Saturdays and they have the tastiest food or whatever you want them to stay. Give them like three talking points and ask them to put that behind the counter with um, whatever shopkeeper is in that day. And anytime someone gets a sticker that that person can share 
uh, a little bit of information about your farmer's market. So super low cost, so many places you can get stickers printed and they can do so much work for you. You can also hang stickers up. You can pin stickers if your coffee, local coffee shop or community center or Y has a bulletin board. You can pin 10 stickers up or you can pin like a little envelope that says like free farmer's market stickers um, for folks to take. So I would recommend not ever selling stickers, just they, they are a uh, marketing and advertising um, line item, and um, they are going to do so much work for you if, if you really get them out there in the community. And every time you give away a sticker at your market, you should also, you should share with your vendors those three talking points that you have um, as well. And um, and th that creates sticky messaging. Like your, your goal with that is that you're then at your local community place and you're just sitting there quietly, not representing the farmer's market in any way. You don't have your sticker or anything on you. And you hear a conversation at the table next to you that is sharing the three talking points that you hear, you know, person A sharing with person B. Oh, yeah. And also they, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something obscure and wonderful about your farmer's market. Um, but you hear them share that information or you hear them share you know, your hours of your market, that means that you've done, you've done a great job. That is, a, that is the ultimate success. I think of it as like, if I'm a fly on the wall and I hear two strangers in town re repeating the messaging that, um, that I wrote six months ago, then um, that's called, that's building a beautiful network of word of mouth um, communication that is supporting your market. And that means that people really believe in your market and they really support your values. People don't want to hear from paid advertising anymore. Um, if you, if there's like a advertisement, maybe it depends on your newspaper and your relationship with your local newspaper, but a lot of paid advertising feels distrustful, like commercials. These days, people really want to hear from um, their friends and their family and from another human being. Um, about why something is so great. So empowering other people to share your message is, is really powerful. Okay, that is my sticker um, monologue. <laughs> In addition to stickers, um, a story card. So a story card, it can be a lot of different things. Uh, I've created tons of story cards for food brands over the years. I think that there might be, yeah, okay, sorry. I zoomed in on this one. So it's a little pixelated here. Um, this is one of my favorite um, projects I've ever worked on, J.Q. Dickinson Saltworks. If you've heard me teach anything before, I've talked about this within food and farming. Um, so they, we printed, this is a story card. It's like a three by five or four by six palm card style Um Thing, and it has a photograph or some kind of messaging, something fun and playful on the front that really communicates your values. Like here, this is this is the founder. She's um, like a seventh generation person in this fam, the salt farm family. The salt farm um, closed in the 50s. It used to do large scale salt farming for like snow and Pittsburgh and um, and salt farming that maybe wasn't so sustainable and she reopened her family business and made it completely um, sustainable. Um, all of the salt is hand harvested and um, she hires local people that uh, feel excited to reconnect with, with the land and the mountains that she is doing this. And so this image here, having her hands holding the salt that she harvested from the ground um, really tells that whole story. And then that's supported on the back here. So everything I just told you is written here. So this is more of an evergreen story. It's like one to two paragraphs that just talk about all the wonderful things about your company or your market. Um, it's not really logistical information. You can have a little logistical information at the bottom, like here's our web address, here's our handle, here's our hours open, if you want to have that on here. Um, and then, and this is really just like an evergreen story about your market and what you believe in and why people should shop there. Okay, so this, that's a story card here. It doesn't have to be designed that way. It can be designed, you know, your, your primary messaging rather than the hands holding salt can be healthy body, sexy body, okay? <laughs> so it's whatever embodies your, uh, your market. 
Um, so the vibe should be true to you, but the idea of like an image or some type of messaging on the front that really represents your market and then a story on the back, um, that format is consistent. And this is something that you're hoping that folks, um, folks will, this should have those three talking points that I talked about earlier that you're giving people, that story on the back should also hit on those talking points in some way. Um, and this should be something that folks want to hang up on the refrigerator that they're really, they're excited to share. So here's, here's another one. So three different styles of story cards. So this is, looks like a um, screen printed or a leather press printed card. So that's a really cool way. If you have a leather press studio in your community or a screen print artist in your community, consider doing a partnership with them and paying them to print a run of story cards for you. If they're leather press, they would make a plate for you. You would tell them what, what you want. They would have a plate made and then they would do a run of 50 or hundred cards. It's gonna be a little bit more expensive than digital printing, but then they have that plate made. So you can go back to them in the future and um, you have your plate already made and you just ask for a new order of them. And then you tell people that that artist in your, um, in your community, in your town, um, made those for you that that's if that embodies your values and if you have kind of like a handmade look that's important to you that's a really great way to go with printing I realized I didn't talk about that on in our chapters so maybe we should maybe I'll add that um so as we see three totally different vibes here here's like a leather press um illustrated story card something really modern um and beautiful and here's something really vintage and talking about the nostalgia and the history. I talked about stickers earlier. Now, I know you all are not necessarily doing like food product design, but um, the sticker thing, I would extend to your um, vendors as well as advice. So lots of food brands that I've worked with haven't quite known how they're going to brand all their products and like which products are going to do well. And so it's a lot to invest in custom um, food packaging. And so this is something that we recommend we, for JQ Dickinson Saltworks. We did a modular sticker system. Um, we've worked with them for 10 years now. We have done whole lines of products under um, from salt to salt partnerships, but this was their very first product and they just weren't quite sure how all this, how the packaging would work together. And they wanted to do glass to reinforce their sustainability values and the story of their family farm. Um, and they wanted people to be able to come and refill their glass jars. So we wanted some, they needed to experiment with their sticker system. So they have um, a permanent sticker, uh, the salt JQ Dickinson salt works, or no, I'm sorry, the O on the left here, this is the permanent sticker. And then on the right, this is specific to this uh, one pound package. So you can, if for your vendors, if you have a strawberry vendor, they can print their logo on a sticker and have their web address. And then they can put that sticker on every single um, batch of strawberries that they send out. And then folks have that. So when they go home, they remember, oh, I bought this from Anne Marie's strawberries. Um, so that reinforces the um, the name. It helps people remember. And then maybe they'll, like I always take my stickers off and I put them on other things because I love a beautifully designed sticker. So maybe they'll keep the sticker. Okay, stamps as well are really wonderful. I talked about these earlier. I think I have worked with farmers market associations before that have used stamps. I think I've, and vendors have used stamps. I think it applies for farmers markets as well. Um, if you want, if you need to brand a bunch of things, if you're doing thank you cards and um, I don't know, yeah, here are coffee cups, although these are not reusable coffee cups. So um, a stamp is really great to be able to just modularly brand a lot of things, just like a sticker. It just kind of depends on what your market wants to do. Okay, so tote bags and power brand ambassadors. So once you have your sticker and your story card, I recommend those are free items for people. Those are giveaways and those come from your marketing budget, okay? Then if you want to create other things that you could sell, um, I would call those merch, then 
you can invest in those as well. So you can give away tote bags if you have in your marketing budget to give away tote bags, wonderful. If you don't, you can sell tote bags um, and just let folks know where the money is going. So, you know, if you buy this tote bag, you're reinvesting back into your farmer's market or you're reinvesting back into your farmer's market. And this money goes to our continued operations and our ability to stay open. Or this money goes to us fundraising for our mural call back to the mural plug for the murals. Um, so let folks know if you're going to sell merch where, where that money goes and then if you want to, you can do, um, you can do like select giveaways of your merch to promote or incentivize people to do something. So say you have your farmer's market table. Okay. People come, maybe you have a table set up when they come into your market before they go into your vendors, you welcome them. Um, you give them a sticker in the story card, maybe when they come or when they leave, and then maybe you have some merch for sale as well. So you have two free items and then you have this, this different merchandise. This is like, these are all done kind of in order. So I probably wouldn't do merch before I had my free giveaway stickers. Um, and so you can sell the merch, but then if you have like an event that you really want folks to come to, um, you can say, hey, for the first, everyone that attends this event um, is entered for, um, a free tote bag and a set of farmer's market merch. It's from our limited edition collection um, of merchandise. Maybe you worked with a local artist to draw on your tote bags. Um, so it's a limited edition, edition artist um, piece and we're giving away up to 10 tote bags. Or you can say like, we're giving away up to 10 um, like swag bags or packs of merch. Um, that represent that 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 are for X Y Z market. Uh, you can incentivize people to come to an event. You can also do the same type of giveaway um, on social media um, and encourage followers. You can say like you can ask folks to you can if you just look online. There's lots of language on how to do this. You can um, ask folks to say, hey, we're giving away um, 10, 10 free tote bags, or we're giving away ten free um farmers market t-shirts at the end of the month like this is our 10th birthday so we're doing this giveaway um everyone that if you tag a friend and your friend follows our page you'll help us build our community and you'll both be entered into this giveaway so giveaways of, of merch that you're usually selling are great uh, ways to incentivize people so here's some beautiful tote bags here um, I think tote bags, you can totally print your logo and your name on a tote bag. I think tote bags are also a really great place to have um, artwork or inspirational messaging uh, around your market. So I have a lot of beautiful art here. Um, two other bags. One color tote bags are cheaper to print. Um, you can also do multicolor bags as well. Um, this is a great opportunity, even if you just want to print your logo to work with, if you have a screen print, local screen print artist that would screen print these, this is a great opportunity to work with a local artist to screen print them. Otherwise, you can totally get them digitally printed. Um, here is an example in Oregon that I really love. Um, You can also do t-shirts. So t-shirts teachers function in the same way. Although I think tote bags, just if, if you're going to do one thing after your stickers and your story cards, I think a tote bag best reinforces uh, brand values for markets because they're reusable. T-shirts are really fun, but then they start to get into like wearable pieces and there's you know discuss like is this going to end up in the landfill what's the second life of a t-shirt and then you can talk to a quilter and they'll tell you that there's a second life but it's just more debatable a tote bag more directly reinforces brand values of a market um, but this is a really fun t-shirt here if you have a budget to print in multicolor um, and to print front and back uh, they are uh, celebrating their market on the front and then on the back they have um, lots of playful information they even have like the time on here so 
um, you can really print whatever you want on a t-shirt. A t-shirt is also a great place to do something kind of wild as a talking talking point for people. So if you wear a funny t-shirt or you have some kind of, um, you know, if you have an apple and a peach like this that are friends or something that represents a story about your market or in your town, they're great talking points for folks to come up and um, and talk to other people about their shirts. So I showed you the JQ Dickinson example earlier. So they're a teeny family farm in West Virginia and um, they now sell their stall all over the world. And um, we did t-shirts for them a few years ago and we have their logo, but we actually took um, the artwork from one of their salt bags, like a canvas salt bag from 200 years ago. And we did a modern version of that. And we worked with a local screen printer and we had them printed. Um, so they're like big bold graphics um, of JQ Dickinson salt. And we actually heard a story of someone in Texas that was wearing the shirt at a restaurant. And um, one of my colleagues or one of someone in our um, in our work group, maybe with JQ Dickinson was in Austin and saw the t-shirt. And then these two folks started talking for hours and then other people joined in. They'd never heard of JQ Dickinson before. And so it created this whole conversation piece around, um, around the salt. So t-shirts are great ways for people to go out into the world and to represent your market. So here's another um, t-shirt. I haven't talked that much about posters today, but you can also do posters as well. I would say those are probably after some of these other things that we've talked about. Yeah, and then last, I just wanted to, I've talked a lot about materials and vendors already, but um, yeah, how to choose materials and vendors. So you want the material to be um, authentic to your market. Um, so these materials, maybe for this market, everything was meant to feel nostalgic and um, harken to the past. Oh, okay, I guess that's that's all I have there. So we we've looked at a bunch of materials today. Um, so anytime that you can um, consider sustainability in your material choice is great. I think I've um, I've driven that home. And again, if you have local printers to work with, I would recommend looking at that first, especially uh, local artists that might screen print, maybe there's a screen print shop locally, um, or that might leather press or do woodblock printing. Those are three really great ways to have limited edition runs of prints made. Um, and great to do, maybe you can't afford to do a leather press Maybe you don't have the budget to do like a leather press giveaway cards forever. So if that's the case, then you could have maybe your your story cards, your story card giveaways digitally printed, but you could do a limited edition run with an artist and sell those as merch, as like collection items. And then that can be a fundraiser for you. So people will always value artist made work more than digitally printed work. So um, that's just something to consider. On the chapter that we put together, there is um, there are recommendations for national printers if you're not able to find one locally. Um, so it's just I'm just gonna go over there and I will show you. Okay, so here is your printed giveaways and goodies chapter um, that elaborates on a lot of the things that I've been talking about today. Um, sticker and a story card, tote bags and other simple printed materials can spread the word about your market. Um, case study, although I've shared a lot of case studies with you today. And then tools and resources here. So just linked up on Canva. Actually, they have templates for stickers and, and card design. So you can check that out. Um, Sticker Mule is a great resource for, um, it's, they're a national online company for printing um, lots of different types of stickers. And um, they also do keychains and um, I think they also do story cards. They do lots of other printing. They have great prices. 
The quality is really good. I don't think they're using sustainable materials. So you just something for you to consider. Um, we do use sticker mules for some of our clients. I'm going to show you an example here in a second. Moo is also a great national online vendor. They're really high quality printing. Um, they're great more for like paper materials. So the story cards, if you wanted to do something, if you want to go crazy and get something embossed, Moo is great for that. Moo is uh, a little more expensive, but they run a lot of sales. So if you want to print with Moo, if, if you look on there and you see something that you'd like to do, sign up for their email list and they'll uh, let you know, like Labor Day weekend, if you print this weekend, everything is half off or something like that. So Moo runs really great sales and I just recommend having design files ready for clients ahead of time. You know, if you've created a sticker or a card in Canva and you know you want to print with Moo um, and you can wait a little bit, then, then look for those sales. And then Vistaprint as well. Uh, Vistaprint, we talked about for signage. They also do tote bags and apparel, but love if you could work with a local screen printer on that. And there's some FAQs here that you all can check out. So lots more for you to read, but I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna pause there. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and I'm just gonna share. Um, so in Appalachia, I work with a podcast um, called Inside Appalachia, if anyone has heard of it. And we do uh, illustrations and stories for them regularly. And then we also do giveaways. Let me turn this off here. Okay, so we have one, just, just one regular giveaway sticker. You know, I've been talking about the sticker is so important. So they put the sticker on everything. Um, we work with a pretty limited budget with this podcast um, in terms of, you know, we're not, we can't, we're not going to print a trillion different things. And so this sticker is can be put on anything. It's great for the back of, it's big enough to be put on the back of the car. It can go on laptops. It can um, go on water bottles. So it's great to, um, to, get, the, to get the word out everywhere. For them, uh, the, the podcast is called Inside Appalachia, but we did this for this focus feature campaign. And so you see that sometimes your value add messaging can be a little bit bigger than your name. So this is their go-to sticker. And then we were able to also do this limited edition artist collection of sticker sheets, of sticker sheets for them. So this was really fun. These are illustrations from some of their top stories that they've told around Appalachia. And um, this, we did these through Sticker Mule and they're really wonderful quality. So just wanted to share that as well. Probably if we do this again, these are all die cut stickers, which is so fun. Like um, hot dogs are really popular in Appalachia. And, and this is, let's see, this is the Flatwoods monster here. So this is a die cut sticker that is actually, die cut means that it's like a custom shape. So die cut stickers are really fun and Sticker Mule is great at doing die cut stickers. You have to prep the file a little bit more, but Sticker Mule has templates for that. So if you just look at Sticker Mule die cut sticker templates, if you Google that, you'll get a whole page of templates and then it'll tell you, it'll give you files to download and, and, and tell you how to do that. So you could just do like one die cut sticker as well. So, okay, I am now gonna pause. We have 15 minutes left. I can't believe I talked this long about stickers and signs. Um, does anyone have questions? Or Madeline and Amanda, did you all see any pressing questions in the chat that you all want to lift up? I see one uh, from Megan. I don't know if you want to come off of mute, Megan, and say that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you recommend having any kind of information um, on stickers or if just a low, we were considering having some made that are just our logo, but now I'm thinking maybe it'd be good to have like website or open hours or something else on there, or maybe just the logo is okay. How big of a sticker are you want to do? I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter. I think, yeah, we so haven't you... created anything yet. So yeah. Okay, so if you do something that you can have like seven point type on there. And I don't know what that is. Canva has like weird type things. As long as it can be legible, 
Mm -hmm. like on all of every die cut sticker here we have the handle and it's really small but you can see it we have their their social media handle Mm -hmm. and so you can um you could do something like that here it's like curved type which you can do really easily in canva um so we have the handle on these die cut stickers and then we have the url here so i would say yes and just pick just pick one thing like don't try and have the handle and the url um think about whatever is the most important communication tool for you like if people go to your I don't know what you use more, your social media account or your website. Probably your website would be the most important thing unless you have like a huge, a very active social media account um, because people can probably access your social media accounts from your website. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If cool. your market has had a location change recently, you might want to spend a year focusing just having your address on that sticker and then maybe the next year go back to like having your website or something like that. But if there, if hours, day or location has changed, that might be for anybody out there. Yeah, that's a great point. Let me talk about that actually. So if you are doing something with specific information like that, if that's the intention, like maybe you print a postcard and it has, I don't have any postcard examples in front of me, but say that this is a postcard, okay? and you have your hours down here and they changed, but say you printed 500 postcards, you have all these postcards left and you're like, dang, what am I gonna do with all these postcards that have the wrong hours? You can get a sticker printed for much cheaper than reprinting all your postcards and put a sticker on top of information that might change. So that's a great way. And then think about if you design that sticker, maybe it's a circle sticker and then, that sticker can have the, the in, replacement information, but it could also be a standalone um, that maybe, you know, or I said your hours, but maybe your address changes like Amanda just said. So maybe you have a postcard, so you get a sticker done with your logo and your new address, and that can be used on your postcards to update them so the postcards are usable and you have that sticker. I've seen so many times where we've tried to put all the information on a print run, and then we printed a set of 500 or a thousand because bigger runs are cheaper per skew. It decreases the individual cost of each object if you print a bigger run. But then if you have information that might change on there, um, it's so frustrating. So just just consider that like, if I'm gonna print 500, do I wanna use these for the next few years? And that will help you make a decision on, okay, well maybe then this isn't the best place for me to put this information that might change or maybe we'll move or um, so that will, the the lifespan, like the, the quantity will determine the lifespan and then the lifespan will help you decide what information goes on the material. Does that make sense? Great, do we have any other questions? No I just want to share an idea about tote bags that I saw at a at markets in Seattle when I was working there. They, you know, the the tote bag was on just like a you know generic light color, and then they had a a, a tote bag dyeing day, or I don't know if they used that word, but they had all these different pots of dye, and then you could come like put your, like change your tote bag's color. It was a total mess and a lot of fun. <laughs> And people went home with their tote bags in little plastic bags to, I don't, and then for the rest of the season, there were all these really cool tote bags in different colors. Um, and it was fun, but it, like kids were a mess for sure after. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I think as you're creating materials for, to promote your market and for other people to, to, to wear and to carry, really think about that second and third life of things and yeah how you could build an event around creating a second life for something I also just want to lift up today because I've really been encouraging you all to think about partnering with artists and designers for printing and for mural work I just want to emphasize so strongly to compensate artists and designers that you partner with and if you don't have the budget to compensate them um, don't ask them for free work, please. 
um, I've been asked for free work so much time, so, so many times in my life. And, um, you know, that's their, that's their craft and that's their trade. And that's how they are uh, making a living. You can, you could acknowledge, Hey, we don't have a budget for this. Or, you know, if you were open to doing sliding scale, this is how much we have. And we could also offer you, you know, maybe you can offer some type of trade, like free coffee at our market for a year or, I don't, I don't know what you might want to offer them, but, but I would just ask that to be respectful with those conversations around working with artists and designers. And um, if you are able to pay them um, the same amount as a company that might print a piece, you could also say that like, this is the budget that we have to print with Vistaprint. We'd really like to print locally. Um, what could we do with this budget? So just food for thought. I'm seeing this question here. Is there a best size or and or shape for stickers? Um, three by let's see, three by three inch, two by two inch stickers. I think is a is a pretty good size. I don't have my. Let me get my. I've been designing a lot of four by four inch stickers recently, but I think that's pretty big. I think it's a, yeah, that's a huge sticker, right? Like that's a real, like, and almost always circles. I'm just like people, do, circles fit on a lot of different things. Squares work as well. You know, I showed you this oval here. I have not designed many oval stickers in my day. Um, I think circles are really great to be able to work on all of those different applications that I was talking about earlier. And I would say like, I think a three inch diameter circle sticker is really wonderful. But if you did two or four inches, four inches is getting pretty big, but um, I don't know. I mean, you could put a four inch sticker on a water bottle or a coffee cup, but it's gonna wrap around and it's gonna change the way you read the message, you know? So, um, I would, yeah, maybe like a three by three circle. I think it's maybe the sweet spot. You can also do die cut stickers. Like I was saying, that's like a custom shape, but I would only do that if you're trying to create, like say you have three of cornerstone pieces of produce in your community. Say it's like strawberries or like for three seasons, like you have one, one, um, one, I'm trying to think of a spring piece of produce. What do we grow in the spring? Sugar snap peas. Sugar snap peas. Strawberry for the summer and then kale in the fall. If you had it in your budget, you could do um, have someone illustrate those three pieces of produce and have like seasonal stickers and you could have the name of your market on the corner of the piece of kale with your website or something like that. Oh my gosh, now I really want a kale sticker. <laughs> yeah, so that's so a die cut sticker is great if you're trying to um, make something, if, if you want it to feel like a strawberry or like an object, um, that's when die cut stickers are great. If you have a logo, um, unless it's an unusual shape, I think it's just fine to have it on a circle or a square, which is gonna be more cost-effective for you. Okay, so I don't have any more questions. I'm gonna ask you all some questions. Um, who is going to make stickers after today? Yay, okay, I have, I see some people. Okay, who's going to start pursuing a um, mural for your farmer's market? Oh, I see one hand. I'm really excited about that. Okay, wonderful. That's great. Um, was this was this helpful? Great. Lots of thumbs up. Perfect. Um, Amanda, Madeline, anything else that we want to cover? We've got five minutes left, or should we? Should we? Oh, budget. Yeah. Hold on. I just saw a question. I saw somebody raise this hand for a second, but maybe that was just an answer that they were 
um, it's gone now. I missed who it was, but maybe they were just saying, I'm going to do a sticker or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, does anyone yeah, have questions about budget? Yeah, I I know that put um, budget because it sounds really great, but I got to see what we've got left in the budget to play with for this year. But that's definitely something I'll look at for next year and putting in the budget, but see where we're at and what we've got. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And some of these things like a, a mural is, a, is that would be amazing if somebody originated the idea of doing a mural and had one done by the end of one season. So a mural is probably going to be a longer term project and the process of doing a mural is important as the outcome. So the process is a way for you to build relationships in your community and um, and invite people into your market. So the, the process of doing, you could do an open call to the community and have an artist or, or you could facilitate some type of creative exercise where you host an event of ideas for your mural and you have magazines all over and you ask people to collage um, different ideas for the mural and you know so there's lots of ways that you can invite people into the process of making a mural um, that also then help them build a relationship with your market so it can be a long-term long-term investment this cave junction farmers market that said they were thinking about a mural do you did you just come up are you like I'm going to do that just now or, or are you already in process on that well, we don't have a permanent, like we have a permanent location, but there's no buildings on the site. So um, actually like we live in a small town and there's like a lot of buildings around here that have walls. And I was thinking about going to some, I, I thought about some local uh, restaurants and that kind of thing that might want to partner with us and let us use one of their walls because we need like beautification. And there's some people that are on the market board that are also like in our downtown, mar downtown marketing to like market the city itself. So I might be able to collaborate with them and see if we can beautify a space. We have a really ugly town. So um, it might be who the whole town to have a beautiful Cave Jumpston Farmer's Market mural. And it probably will be a couple years in the works, but I think it's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Keep us I, just wanted to, I just wanted to say too, um, we do a lot of fundraisers for our marketing. Um, you know, like we have an $800 budget and we do like a chili cook-off every year. That we probably raise about three thousand dollars for uh proceeds from it we split that with the radio station in town so like we partner with the radio station and in turn they do a lot of free advertising for us all the time so uh get with your local radio station and see if you can collaborate uh we do cakewalks we do bingo once a year for the elders um we do a 50 50 raffle at each and every market where you know like we someone goes around and sells raffle tickets and 50% um, of the proceeds go to the market and 50% goes back to the person that wins the raffle. So we have constant ongoing fundraisers. So if you guys don't have, um, you know, budgeting for your marketing, I just encourage you to find just little ways to make it, you know. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's a wonderful way to end the conversation because we unfortunately have to have money to do a lot of the things that we're talking about today. So thank you for sharing. So I think we are, I'm gonna sign off from here. It was so nice to have you all as an audience today. I'm shocked that I talked about stickers this long. So thank you for giving me that moment in my life. I'm sure no one will ever give me that much time to talk about how much I love stickers and murals again. Um, it was a pleasure to meet all of you and um, best of luck with your markets. Thank you so much, Megan. Yeah. And we'd love to see your stickers and examples of what you guys make. So please send, send us pictures of your signage and um, we, can, we can post it and share it with other people, with other markets. And uh, we'd just like to have like a library of what you guys have made. So thanks everybody. We'll see you at the next, at the next workshop. <laughs>